Let's sing together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dared not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His oath is covenant, his blood support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all, Lord, you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all, Lord, you will be. You are King of creation and King of my life, King of the land and the sea. You were King of the heavens before there was time, and King of all kings you will be. We bow down and we crown you the King, we bow down. And we crown you the king, we bow down. And we crown you the king, king of all kings you will be. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds him. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people. Surround us, Lord. Surround Surround us, Lord, as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds His people, as the mountains Surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. Surround us, Lord. So Surround us, Lord. Surround us, Lord. 
surround us, Lord. We need to be in your presence. Surround us, Lord. So Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, we humbly come before you. We ask that you surround us and that we draw close to you. We are so humbled that you spoke the world into existence and everything we can see, touch, you created. And you care about us so much, so much that your son, your innocent son, will die for us. So we have a plan to get back to you in heaven. We can be forgiven of our sins. We can live forever with you. Help us each day to realize that this isn't our permanent home. Our permanent home is with you. And that so many things we care about now will just float away and we'll have much more important things, the spiritual things that really matter. Please be with each of my brothers and sisters, which we're very grateful for, the church. Help us to care for each other and love each other. Help us to love you, God, with everything we have and never forget that we love our neighbors as ourselves. Be with those who are sick or grieving. Please comfort them. And we thank you for answered prayers. We look to you for all things. Help us to spread your word, the good news throughout this week. Help our worship be in spirit and truth. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. These next two songs were um, chosen um, to help us prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, to commune together in memorial of uh, what God, what Christ has done for us on the cross. Um, an oldie goalie, if you will, and a newer song. I love mixing the old with the new. I think it, um, it uh, you might have noticed that um, earlier we sang My Hope is Built on Nothing Less. Later we'll sing a new version of that song, and I believe I, I think there's value in that, in that God continually makes all things new. He refreshes us. He redeems us. He brings us um, a spirit of, of newness and aliveness. And I think that's expressed in the way we continually find these new ways of expressing his eternal qualities. So let's sing together and, um, and remember what he's done for us once and for all and for all time. Mm -hmm. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners were slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling Change it someday for a crown. 
In that old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For twas on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown. Wonderful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, you rescue the souls of men. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for Counselor, Comforter, Keeper Spirit we long to embrace You offer hope when our hearts have Hopelessly lost our way Oh, we've hopelessly lost our way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your own, here in our weakness you find us falling before your throne. Oh, we're falling before your throne. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. You are the one that we praise. Good morning. I just want to remind everybody, I don't know if it was said earlier, but um, 
you had had a chance to get one of the communion cups that are out back in the basket, please feel free to do that now. Um, we can uh, partake in the Lord's Supper together. You know, I often talk about a <clears throat> little church near our house. It's got a little marquee on it. And a lot of times they have some profound messages. And one of the ones they had back on Veterans Day that I, I saw and I, I still remember, um, it said, never has so much been owed by so many to so few. And that was a really, that really kind of struck me on, on, on Veterans Day. You know, we, we do honor our veterans and owe them so much. But as I was thinking about that, I said, you know, the same really could be said for Christ, really. Couldn't we change that up just, just slightly and say, never has so much been owed by so many to just one. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, we're, we're familiar with uh, John 15, chapter 15, verse 13. You know, where it says, no greater love than this, than to lay down his life. I mean, we're familiar with that. We've read that. And, and that's, that verse is referred to a lot in the Lord's Supper. But a couple others I want to, I want to kind of read to you that, uh, that I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with, but maybe hasn't been heard as much. Is in Hebrews nine, chapter twenty-eight, and it says, "So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and He will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him." And then in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to serve. Or, I'm sorry. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give His life as a ransom for many. And then the last one I want to share with you is Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2. And walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So as we read these and we remember, you know, this is why I, I, I want to focus on that, on that saying, never has so much been owed by so many to one person. And again, that's our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So as we take of this communion, this Lord's Supper together, let us remember that sacrifice, the sacrifice that He gave for us. That he was nailed to the cross, that He shed His blood for us so we would have hope of eternal life. Would you bow with me, please? Our Father who art in heaven, we come in prayer to you to give offering or to offer thanks for this bread, this bread which represents your Son and our Savior's body that was that was sacrificed on the cross, that he freely gave to be nailed, to, to go through the pain that he did, so that we don't have to suffer. Fathers, we take of this bread, let us remember that that sacrifice and that body that he gave up so that we can be one with Him. In Your Son's holy name we pray. Amen. You'll bow with me again. We'll give <clears throat> thanks for the fruit of the vine. <clears throat> Our Father who art in heaven, we continue this, this offering of thanks for the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood. Father, that, that precious blood that 
that he sacrificed and he shed on the cross, the blood that we are washed anew in, for the forgiveness of our sins to give us passage into, into heaven. Father, that gives us that salvation that he sacrificed for us. Father, if we take the shrew of the vine, let us remember that, that blood that washes over us and cleanses us and cleans us and keeps us and makes us whole. It's in your son's holy name we pray. Amen. So that concludes the Lord's Supper. Now it's just a uh, matter of convenience. We take this time to give an uh, offering of thanks for what we've been blessed with and to give back, give back to Him. Will you pray with me, please? Our Father who art in heaven, we are, are blessed in so many ways, blessed more than we deserve. And we just thank you for all that you've provided for us, Father. You, you provided for all of our physical needs, the Father, we know you also provide for our emotional and spiritual needs. The Father, part of those physical needs that, that, that we have is to uh, continue your work and to, to bring others to you so that they may know the power of your love and the power of salvation through your Son. Father, as we take of this, let us give with a free heart and an open heart and a joyful heart back to what is only rightfully yours. Father, just uh, thank you again for all that you do for us. In his name we pray. Amen. I'll be reading Psalms 27, 11 through 14. <clears throat> Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. You'll remain standing. Um, for those of you who have children um, from preschool to fifth grade, we have a children's hour prepared for them. You'll just follow the crowd toward the back and down the stairs so that, that will be ready for them. Uh, let's sing one more song before Michael comes and brings his message. <clears throat> There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From the star God created man, he is our God, the great I am. There was a long, long time ago, a God whose voice the prophets heard. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From the star God created man. 
He is our God, the great I am. Our God who sun upon a tree, a life was willing there to give. That he from sin might set man free, and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live, and we survive. From the star God created man, he is our God. The great I am. Amen. Be seated. Good morning. Last week we talked about trusting God. <clears throat> Do we really trust God? Most of us would say, yes, we do trust God. But at the same time, we tend to want to take things into our own hands. We want to handle the situation. Well, sure, God said he'd do this thing. But you know what? I've got to make it happen. And this tends to get us in trouble. If we look all through the Old Testament, all the different stories, we see this situation playing out over and over and over again. God has a plan. Man wants to step in, force the situation, force the plan, and they never needed to do that in the first place. It just causes problems. And we saw that with Abraham and with Isaac lying about their wives and saying they were actually their sister. They didn't have to do that. But fear got the best of them. And so they stepped in, they tried to control the situation. Well, this morning... I wanted to kind of piggyback on that lesson and talk about God's timing. I think we're all aware that God does not operate on the same timeline as us. And again, lots of stories about that. Again, we can go right back to Abraham. Abraham has promised a child. He's promised that he's going to father a great nation. Except he's old. And Sarah's old. So what do they do? They take the situation in their own hands. They try to force an outcome. Isaac is not going to be born until years and years and years after God makes the promise. And they get impatient. God's not moving quite as fast as they would like. So Sarah gives Abraham her servant. She has Ishmael. There, we fixed it. We made it happen. Except that was never the plan. That wasn't supposed to happen. You know, we talk a lot about how God is patient with us. Sometimes we need to be patient with God. I want us to look at an old, uh, a story in the Old Testament that we're all familiar with. We've known it since we were kids in Sunday school. We probably don't know all the background to it. And I did this lesson a couple weeks ago with the uh, young professionals class, and so they're getting a little bit of a repeat. We're going to talk about Aaron and the golden calf. So Moses, he's leading the Israelites out of Egypt. And it's done in a quite miraculous fashion. There are ten plagues. There's the crossing of the Red Sea. They're out in the wilderness, and God is providing for them. He's giving them food. He's giving them water. And this entire time, the Israelites are grumbling. They're not happy. Moses, make us happy. Before they even get to Mount Sinai, they keep on saying, we should have stayed in Egypt. We should go back to Egypt. God's doing amazing things right there in front of them, but the Israelites are pretty short-sighted, and when any problem comes up, it's just the end of the world for them. Oh, that we had just died in Egypt. We should just go back. Let's throw in the towel, we're done for, give up. Finally, they get to Mount Sinai. And once again, God makes his presence known in a big way, there is smoke and thunder and lightning on the mountain, and it is terrifying. It is so terrifying that they tell Moses, you go talk to God. We can't talk to him. We can't get anywhere near that. 
We'll die if we come that close. You go talk to him. Well, yeah, that was the plan to begin with. Moses is the one who's going to talk to him. Moses is the one who's leading them. Moses is the intermediary. He's the go-between between God and the people. And the Israelites, they really need that intermediary. They need that go-between because think about where they've been. They've been slaves their entire life. They've had slave masters over them since they were born. Telling them what to do and when to do it and where to go. They really can't make any decisions for themselves. They need someone to tell them what to do. That's why Moses is there. He's going to do that for them. And so now they're at Mount Sinai. And God tells Moses to go up there. And they're going to talk. So Moses goes up on the mountain. And he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights. He's up there for a long time. And this is when the golden calf episode happens. Read through Exodus 32, 1 through 6. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold, that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. So here's what always confused me about this story. How can the people turn their back on God when they can still see his presence right there on the mountain? They were there for the ten plagues. They were there when they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. They have seen his power over and over and over again. So how can they just turn to an idol right there on the spot and actually be happy about it? Like it's no big deal. Like it's a good thing. Well, the answer is they didn't turn their back on God. At least not in their thinking. Notice that after the golden calf is made, they say, these are your gods. Plural. What they're saying is the God that called Moses, the one who's up there on the mountain, he's still there. He's still there, and they're still worshiping him. But now there's another God in the mix. And in verse 5, Aaron makes a proclamation. He says, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. The word Lord is Yahweh. Yahweh is that God up there on the mountain. They didn't turn their back on him. They just added another one into the mix. From our standpoint, that's exactly what they should not do. This is completely 100% wrong. We know that. It's a sin. They don't seem to have a problem with it. They're actually having a celebration. Why would they be happy about it? Well, where have they been living their entire life? Egypt. These people have been ingrained with Egyptian society, Egyptian politics, Egyptian religion. They grew up in Egypt and all they know is Egypt. This God of Moses, this God who's up there on the mountain, he's actually kind of new to them. This is a fairly recent development. Egypt is polytheistic, meaning multiple gods. And there's never really been an argument against that for these Israelites. That's just the way it is. And so now they've seen the power of Yahweh. So it stands to reason all these other gods that we've known our entire life and that we grew up with, well, they probably have a lot of power too. Right? They can probably do stuff too. They can work miracles too. 
And it's not really a problem if we have multiple gods here with us. That's their thinking. When Aaron is confronted about this, Moses is obviously angry. It's very clear he should not have done this. And so his response is to tell a lie. Exodus 32, 21 through 24, And Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you that you have brought such a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, Let not the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they are set on evil. For they said to me, Make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out, out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So I said to them, Let any who have gold take it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it in the fire, and out came this calf. Now, when we read this, we tend to think that this is the worst lie in the history of lies. This obviously did not happen. You don't just throw the gold in a fire and, oh, out pops a calf. Great. So if the lie is that bad, why would Aaron tell it? Put yourself in the Israelite shoes. They believe in multiple gods. They have seen miracles. Lots of miracles. Is it really so far-fetched that another god comes along and shows himself? Does something crazy? Something amazing? If you believe there are lots of gods that have this power, is this lie really that crazy? If Aaron was telling this lie to any of the other Israelites, they would probably say, that makes sense. Yeah, that sounds like something that God would do. I believe it. But here's where it gets interesting. Not telling it to any of the other Israelites. He's telling it to Moses. Moses has come down off the mountain and is now confronting them about making this cow. You ever wonder why it was a cow? I mean, of all the things to pick, why would they pick a cow to make an idol out of? This is Apis. Apis is an Egyptian deity. He's a highly regarded and very important deity in Egypt. It's believed he was the very first Egyptian god that they worshipped. What's important to know about Apis is that he was also considered an intermediary between humans and the other gods. They held festivals once a year where they would take a bull into the temple and they believed that the spirit of Apis would inhabit this bull. And so they would ask questions about their future, questions that they needed answers to, whatever it was. They would ask the bull questions and the bull would wander around the temple and whichever door it went through, that's the answer to the question. They could also tell the bull certain things that they needed from the gods, and after it was over, he would go back and report to them. Apis is an intermediary. Apis is the main god they go to with questions. He's the one they, they, that would tell them what the other gods expected, what they wanted. He is the go-between. Why would the Israelites decide to make this God? Well, what was it they said to Aaron? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. People needed Moses as the intermediary between them and Yahweh. Except Moses has been gone for a while. After a month, they're getting a little worried. Did he die? Did God strike him dead? He may never come back. And if that's the case, what are we going to do? We need someone to tell us what God, Yahweh, up there on the mountain, wants us to do. Apis could tell us what he wants. He could report back. He would know. Moses was our go-between. Now, Apis will be our go-between. This is a sin. We find out in verse 28, it's a sin that leads to the death of 3,000 men. 
They are killed. And why? Because they were impatient. Because God was taking too long. God wasn't working on their timeline. He wasn't telling them what they wanted to know when they wanted to know it. And so they forced the issue. They took the matter into their own hands because we've got to do something now. We're tired of waiting. We don't know how long we'll be waiting. We don't even know if or when God's going to do anything. So we got to do something now. We have to figure it out. I think we all know that God's timing is not always our time. Sometimes He does things a little faster than we want. Sometimes He does things a little slower than we want. The question is, do we trust Him enough to actually leave it in His hands and say, Your will be done? Or do we feel the need to go ahead and step in, take over, and say, My will be done. I got this. I'll handle it. I'll do it on my terms. Now, Isaiah 30, 15 through 18. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you were unwilling. And you said, No, we will flee upon horses. Therefore, you shall flee away. And we will ride upon swift steeds. Therefore, your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee till you are left like a flagstaff on top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you. The Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. This entire chapter here in Isaiah is bad. It's about how the Israelites are destroyed. They've been rebellious. Now they're being punished. And in verse 15, in quietness and in trust shall be your strength, but you were unwilling. They don't trust God. They don't have faith in Him. They don't really believe the promises that He's made to them. So they take matters into their own hands and they run away. But right there at the end, the Lord waits to be gracious to you. Mercy's coming. You will be saved. It is going to happen, yeah? When's it going to happen? Blessed are those who wait for Him. He waits on us. We have to wait on Him. He is patient with us. We have to be patient on Him. And that's not always easy. That is a hard thing to do. Because He sees the bigger picture, He knows the plan, and we don't. We don't always see it or know it, and that makes us anxious. That makes us nervous. It makes us want to go ahead and jump the gun and say, okay, I'll take it from here. I got this. Jeremiah, he has the same message in the book of Lamentations. The whole book is about the destruction of Jerusalem. It's, it's seeing this terrible thing happen, and Jeremiah is witnessing his entire life crumble around him, and yet, he writes in Lamentations 3.25, The Lord is good to those who wait for Him, to the soul who seeks Him. Even though it is all falling apart, it's not the end. It's not over. God is good to those who wait for Him. But waiting requires a whole lot of trust. It's very easy to become like the Israelites who see Moses, go up there to get some instructions, and we're happy about that. It's great. God's going to tell us what to do and how to do it, and we're going to be his nation, and this is going to be awesome. He's gone for a week. He's gone for two weeks. Now it's been 20 days. Now it's been 30 days. We start to think maybe he's not coming back. Maybe we're going to have to find another 
way to do this. And when we do that, we are building idols for ourselves. We are putting our trust somewhere other than God. We're telling him, well, I waited on you, but I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what you wanted. You were taking way too long, so I just went ahead and did this thing. And here's the result. And God says, yeah, that's not the result I wanted. That's not what I wanted for you. That was never planned. God's timing is not always our timing. And that can be really frustrating. That can be difficult for us, but we have to remember Isaiah 55, 8, and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He sees the big picture. He knows the plan. And even though it's frustrating and when we don't see it and we don't know it, we have to be able to simply trust him. And to say, I know, God, that you've got it. That it's in your hands. We have to have faith that he knows what is best for us, but also when it's best for us. We close this morning with an invitation for you to do that very thing. To put your faith and your trust in Him. To turn your life over to Him totally and completely. If you need to put Christ on in baptism, or if you need prayers or the assistance of the church, then we offer this invitation to you. You can come to the front when we sing this invitation song. And we'll be happy to help you with whatever you need. You need to take advantage of this. This is the time. Please come while we stand. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm. He Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in Him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne.
alone, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all, Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He Father, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for the opportunity to come here today and uh, worship you. Father, we're blessed in so many ways, and we're, we're just thankful for that. Father, we're weak, and, and we're thankful for forgiveness. And we pray for your guidance and strength as we strive to do your will. Pray, Lord, as we leave here today, we'll take you with us. In Christ's name, amen.